in the heart of North America's urban jungles. Amidst the towering skyscrapers and bustling streets is a hidden world of winged wonders. Birds. These avian vagabonds have not only survived, but thrived in our concrete jungles, adapting to the challenges of city life in remarkable ways. As cities have expanded and sprawled into their natural habitats, many bird species have undergone significant adaptations to cope with their new environments. Let's take a closer look at how birds adjust to life in the city. While there are many challenges for bird species that come from urban sprawl and development, some species have taken a different approach and sought opportunity from the mess. Birds like pigeons and sparrows have become city dwellers, utilizing buildings and human structures as substitutes for natural nesting sites. Additionally, some species have altered their vocalizations to communicate in noisy urban environments, ensuring their calls are heard above the hustle and bustle of the city. But it's not just bird behavior that's changed. The physical characteristics of urban birds have also started to evolve. For instance, studies have shown that urban dwelling birds often have shorter wings and longer beaks compared to their rural counterparts. Adaptations that aid in maneuvering through tight spaces and accessing food in urban landscapes. Research also suggests that this urbanization is having an effect on the eye size of birds living in cities. Much like the lens of a camera, animal irises will shrink and expand, dilate and contract to bring in more or less light. As the larger surface area of the eye, the more light that hits it. Non-migratory birds like cardinals living in cities will rarely experience true darkness, and as a result, larger eyes will no longer be an evolutionary advantage that they pass through their species. A study by Washington State University actually found that Carolina wrens and northern cardinals living inside San Antonio, Texas, both had 5% smaller eyes than those of the same species living just outside the city borders. They also found that migratory birds did not share this distinction, further supporting their hypothesis as those migratory birds would leave the city and experience true darkness in their travels. Despite these adaptations, urban birds still face numerous challenges, including pollution, habitat loss, and collisions with buildings. However, efforts are growing by local communities and conservation organizations to work to mitigate these threats and create bird-friendly urban environments. One such initiative is the establishment of wildlife preserves within urban areas, such as the sprawling Riverwood Conservancy in the heart of Mississauga, just outside of Toronto. These green spaces serve as vital sanctuaries for birds, providing essential habitat and refuge from the pressures of city life. So it's so important to have areas like Riverwood and other conservation areas, particularly in the middle of the city, because of the mounting pressures in urban areas. It's really important to be able to provide you know, food, habitat, uh, other resources for, for wildlife, and to be able to have proper nesting, uh, safe private nesting uh, materials and spaces for all of those birds. Um, it's also particularly important for migratory birds to have these kinds of stopover locations. So even if they're not nesting in places like Riverwood, they definitely use these sites on their way up to their nesting grounds uh, through their entire migration route. So here at Riverwood, we do a lot of different restoration work to try and make sure that we have a proper habitat for all of our wildlife, certainly birds included. Um, and a big part of that is the removal of invasive plant material and the replacement of beautiful native plants that provide habitat, that provide food, uh, all sorts of really good opportunities for bird populations to be able to thrive. In addition to that, we do a lot of bird boxes around here. So we have bird boxes for you know wood ducks, we have uh, bird boxes for screech owls, and um, barn swallows and all sorts of really cool birds that we really want to attract to the site. And so um, that's a big part of what we do is creating those, uh, those pieces of habitat for them uh, so that they're able to just kind of come to the site and move in you know, as soon as they possibly can. Um, and then of course, one of the big things that we're, we're a real big fan of is making sure that uh, we restrict some access to areas where there are really sensitive habitats for birds. And so when people come to Riverwood, uh, we really love when they are able to stay on the trails because uh, there are a lot of sense of habitats that, that we can compromise just by being around those areas. And so uh, educating the public, making sure that they're aware of these opportunities to be able to engage with, uh, with conservation of bird species um, and to be able to um, do their part in supporting it by taking a back seat when needed and then being able to, um, to actively support birds when, when able as well. Additionally, we've really been able to leverage all the excitement and passion that our community at Riverwood has for birds to be able to engage them in, in really concrete and informative citizen science initiatives. And what that's meant for us has been 
uh, bio blitz initiatives where the community comes out to identify as many different species as they can. Uh, we do uh, bird counts. We catalog all of the species that we find at Riverwood and that data has been invaluable in being able to identify trends in avian populations um, and particularly in urban areas where we've seen uh, a lot of change over time of these populations. To be able to keep track of that and to be able to make sure that we're doing what we need to do uh, to protect those bird species. I think one of the most obvious challenges that our birds face in a city landscape is habitat loss. And a lot of our minds immediately go to clear cutting a forest, which obviously has a huge impact on our bird species, but it's more than that. Field ecosystems, wetland ecosystems, there are birds that rely on niche habitats that are being destroyed um, due to development, due to urban sprawl in general. So habitat loss is probably one of the major impacts that humans have on our bird populations to date. We have to start thinking about what replaces those habitats and it's usually larger buildings. And with those buildings, we have a lot of light, we have a lot of noise. So noise and light pollution are another huge challenge that our birds have to face now in these urban landscapes. Noise in the form of cars or trains or airplanes or just people in general, that impacts how birds can communicate with each other, especially during the breeding season when they need to communicate to find a mate. That can really impact them. And then light pollution. Um, if you've ever driven down a street in Toronto, there's a lot of these high rise buildings that have all of their lights still on. And this confuses our migratory bird species that are really reliant on these dark skies for migrating. And those are two major challenges that our birds face. Now, continuing on that, what do all of these buildings have? A lot of windows and glass, and glass is super reflective. And birds aren't able to see that or distinguish between their environment and these glass faces. So what happens is that we have a lot of casualties or collisions with these windows. And so one of the things that we're seeing now with these high rise buildings is that we have a lot more of our bird species on their migratory routes colliding with buildings that maybe weren't there on their migratory route the year before or 10 years ago. Another major challenge that our birds are facing are our cute and cuddly dogs and cats. Unfortunately, some people let their dogs and cats free roam or off leash on our trails and they actually turn into predators of our birds. We see this majorly with free roaming cats that are coming into conservation areas or even in subdivisions and are now predating on our wildlife or on our native bird species. These birds already have natural predators but now have more predators because these cats are free roaming. I'm gonna mention some things that you can do in your own backyard or on your balcony to support our bird species. But if you can't do any of those things, just advocating for our birds, advocating for policies and regulations that support bird species and supporting conservation areas and non-for-profit organizations that also support our bird species. So if you can't do any of the other things that I'm gonna to speak to, just being a, a major bird advocate is important as well. Now, the first thing I would say that's really important is to remove those grass lawns. If you have a house with a really big grass lawn, incorporating some native trees, native shrubs, native wildflowers goes a long way. It provides habitat, it provides food, it can sometimes even provide nectar if you're looking at something like a ruby-throated hummingbird. Um, our service berry trees, which are an awesome native plant, offer thousands of these berries to cedar waxwings. Tulip trees, another really great Carolinian native species, offer seeds to our cardinals. And then you look at asters that provide seeds to goldfinch in the winter. So there's lots of native plants that you can incorporate into your garden if you want to help and support these birds that don't have a lot of habitat or food left. Another thing is if you don't have a lawn or maybe you live in an apartment building and you have a balcony, you can incorporate container gardening. So you can incorporate native plants into containers and still offer habitat for insects. It's more of a bottom up approach to supporting our birds. You provide the plant that attracts insects, that attracts the bird that feeds on that insect. So another thing you can do going back to window collisions is you can actually incorporate window decals on your windows to ensure that you reduce the amount of collisions or casualties of birds. It is recommended to have smaller dots that are about two inches to four inches apart. I know there's a lot of people that incorporate decals of those birds, but they really need to be close together to ensure that birds see 
the entirety of your window. So ensuring that it's about two inches to four inches apart. And this doesn't have to be expensive decals. You can also do it with uh, washable markers or washable paints on the outside or inside of your windows. It can be a fun art project to ensure that birds see your window when they're either migrating or just flying by. Now, once you've created this really neat garden in your backyard or on your balcony, it's really important to avoid the use of pesticides and herbicides. They will kill off any kind of insect that will be attracted to your garden, and that really negates the purpose of your garden was to provide habitat, to provide biodiversity in your backyard or on your balcony to support our bird species. As we continue to expand and develop our urban landscapes, it's essential that we recognize and appreciate the resilience and adaptability of the birds that call these cities home. Through conservation efforts and the creation of these bird-friendly habitats, we can ensure that future generations will continue to marvel at the beauty and diversity of our feathered friends. For these feathered friends, our concrete jungles have unwillingly become their home, and it's on us to make sure that they don't just survive, but they thrive for generations to come.